Hey, it's Corey Booker. I'm about to start an Instagram live with uh, Eddie Gloud, and now I'm going to try to find Eddie uh, in this. But I'm so grateful folks are joining for tonight. Um, let's see. I'm going to see if he's there. There he is. There he is. <laughs> this uh, this makes me very happy, my brother. He did it. He did it. You you dressed up in a tie. I knew you were gonna go all Sunday professor. I I have a raggedy old uh, uh, a Rucker shirt on that I've been wearing uh, for a long time. I knew you were gonna put on, but I figure I do. This is my studio, Eddie, and and I. Uh, do a lot of Zoom calls, and I always have to put on a top shirt and tie, and I will usually wear shorts underneath. Um, but you're all like straight up professor. And after I watched, and I hope if people like this conversation and want more, they will go online and watch you and Cornell West. <laughs> I tell you, there were I can't tell you five times I had to stop, rewind, and hear because you two, when you get going, it's almost lyrical oh, in the way man. that you you speak. It is it is this combination of art forms from rap to poetry to uh, to to bona fide, in my opinion, like literary geniuses uh so i hope people if they like this with a uh, uh with me dressed down to go watch cornell in his three-piece suit <laughs> what about and, this? and you i'll take off my jacket how about that <laughs> you make me feel a lot more comfortable a lot more see you cornell i've always had up here you at least are accessible because you're my peer <laughs> So for people, I want to get into conversation as quickly as possible, but I just want to give some context to people about my relationship with you. Um, I had become elected, elected mayor of the city of Newark and was invited to participate in a roughly monthly dinners down in Princeton and by uh, uh, one of the great pastors of Newark. Um, and I tell you, I, he, he ended up giving me one of the great gifts of me emerging into this new level of public life because I found with you and, and Dr. West and others that, that just sitting and listening, being in, in fellowship with uh, this group of men was so sustaining to my soul. But I discovered you really around those tables and then have just become a, not only a friend, but more importantly, you are somebody that I look up to and you, your multiple books have given me language um, to better speak to my own heart yearnings as well as to, to cr sort of critiquing this country in a way that has been so helpful to me and challenging me. I found through your words, challenging my own uh, political perspectives. And, and the last thing I'll say, just sort of describing our friendship before we get into a conversation is um, when I wrote my own book, uh, there was really the person I wanted most to, to, to claw it open and, and give me feedback because you step, it is hard. And you said something more profound, which I hope we can get to about, this book almost cost you your life. Uh, it was a journey for you, which was so profound. But I just want you to know, everybody who's listening to know that um, what you did for me in my journey, which is, was very difficult in and of itself, I think going where you've gone in this book is infinitely harder. But you became such a great, um, uh, just just a sounding board for me to get, to pour my heart into a, a book that did, I hope didn't read like a political book, but more read like, an ode to the values of love. And that's the final thing I'll say to everybody who's listening tonight. I hope you call other folk, tell them to get on board because tonight I think that the, the, everything we're gonna be talking about are threads that lead back to the same ideals of love. So uh, anyway, that's my introduction for one of the greater influences of my, on my life from his uh, intellectual acumen and his spiritual soul force. And uh, to have him be a peer is really important uh, to me just to know that I'm, uh, uh, that God put us on the earth in the same journey in the same trench, so to speak. Oh man, well, you know, uh, this. Is, is my volume? Your volume, you're a little choppy to me, uh, uh, but- um, That's a problem. Let me, go let ahead. Me my, let me go. put on my uh, air, but maybe this will help. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't. So, so, you know, I just say to you that I've cherished every moment uh, of us being together. 
those meetings in the in late there, late into the late into the afternoon, restaurant would close, um, and we would just be chopping up and chopping about all the things, um, and those hugs, the hugs, those legendary hugs, um, where you would literally envelop me, um, and for your openness, we don't always agree. But the major thing is always in love. Um, and I love to read every word of tonight, looking back. And you read the word of democracy, push it back. Um, and I just, just, just been uh, one of the uh, couples of God's grace uh, that, that He allowed me to, to walk the planet and walk. So I'm just delighted to, to have this conversation with you tonight. I appreciate that. I'm reading all the people that are saying that a lot of people cannot hear. So um, I'm try. hoping that they'll tell me that they can hear me, but I'm not sure what's what's uh, what, what's causing this. And I don't have my tech team here. Um, uh, and somebody's saying maybe my volume's too high, so I'm turning that down. Yeah, let me try um, another. I'm going to try another set of earphones too. Let's see what happens. Okay. And the, and I, I see some people giving me thumbs up now. Um, cut off all other audio, and maybe I'll do the same thing. I'll put my earphones in, see if that works too. Okay. This is too important of a conversation tonight. Uh, somebody's saying that I'm good, uh, so uh, you can hear me. I, I'm glad this feedback is so constructive. It uh, is. I, I appreciate everybody who's out there saying much better on my end. I'm going to put this in, though, because your volume might be somehow messing up mine. All right, Eddie, try speaking now. What about now? That seems like it's better. A lot better. Okay, that's a lot better. Exactly. And somebody just said your your sound is is good, Doc. Um, <laughs> and that's... now they're saying my sound isn't isn't crisp. But okay, so uh, I'm fine. Okay, good. I'm 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 gonna say by the I'm getting lots of thumbs up, lots of waves. I'm so, seeing. So let's go. Uh, so, so but I'm let me embarrassed, just... man. Let me say this again. I want to embarrass you again because the volume was cutting off. The, the beauty of our relationship, Senator Booker, Brother Corey, right, is that it's rooted in love. Every time you give me that bear hug that you give me, where I literally disappear in your arms, every time we talk and we are genuinely trying to figure something out together, I just want to say that it's a blessing just to walk this journey with you. And it's an example of God's grace that we're doing this together. So just thank you, brother. I just wanted to just say that so that everybody could hear it now that the, the volume is up, <laughs> you know, so I just wanted right. Well, why don't, we, why don't we just go, because you and I are both born after Malcolm, Medgar, King, after, uh, after Goodman, Cheney, Schwarner, after um, uh, lynchings that the NAACP used to uh, hang that flag out uh, and, uh, about someone was lynched today. And we come after this period of, of mass bloodshed and grief, but there were still some heroes that remained. Um, and we lost two of them this week. And they both so embodied a, a, a type of love that um, I aspire to and fail at mightily. But I'm wondering if, if you, and I heard you on, uh, on MSNBC, uh, speak uh, so so movingly. I'm hoping that maybe you could um, contextualize those two men and speak to their their virtues um, and why they're so relevant today. Still, you know, I just I just want to lift them up. You know, uh, I'm a country boy from Mississippi. Uh, if it wasn't for all of those improbable aristocrats who came down into my little hometown and 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 desegregated the the, the swimming pool, put their lives on the line. Um, it's important for us to really put in context what they did and who they are. You know, there's this line I, I came across, I've been quoting it over and over again because it, it just jumped out at me. I've never read, you know, across this bridge by, by, you know, which is this advice of John Lewis to our generation where he talks about faith and courage and action and the like. But that definition of faith, he says, faith is being so sure of what the spirit has whispered in your heart that your belief in its eventuality is unshakable. Hmm. Nothing can make you doubt that what you have heard will become a reality. 
even if you do not live to see it come to pass. You never doubt that it will be. And you know, this is the kind of faith that John Lewis exhibited as he went into the bowels of the South and faced this violence, because the violence was on his body. And, and you know, as, as those young SNCC like the chairperson of Student Nonviolence Committee, they said he wasn't the smart person put his body on the line. And, um, you know, we can tend to, we lift him up as this hero, as this iconic figure. But if we tell the story of John Lewis, we have to tell the story of that courage and his commitment and his love and his faith that made you and I possible. C.T. Vivian, that image of Sheriff, Jer you know, Sheriff Jer uh, Jim Clark punching him in the mouth. Yes. And he jumped right back up and put that finger out and started lecturing him on democracy. And both of these men in their older, in, in, in their older years um, loved me personally. C.T. Vivian's smile would just light up a room and lit me up. And I worked for John Lewis as a sophomore. At I didn't know that. Yeah, I, so the irony, I worked in the Julian Bond campaign in 86. So I saw that extraordinarily painful moment so yes. I worked in the bond campaign and then ended up working in his in John Lewis's Atlanta office wow. as a young as a young you know Mississippi guy going to Morehouse College and just just amazing human beings man we've lost two giants upon sh upon whom shoulders we stand now what is this there's a confusion with Congressman Lewis where people called him nice and and uh, almost sort of like try to uh, 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 create. A, I, I love what Cornell West says about Martin Luther King: the Santa Clausification exactly. of Martin Luther King. Exactly. Uh, um, and uh, I, I just I wonder sometimes how um, uh, John Lewis. People want to make him a cuddly teddy bear, but he was not. And yeah, and and had a a, a, a sort of a a ferocious love that um, could level um, uh, his adversaries in a way that uh, didn't destroy them and their dignity, uh, but seemed to elevate us all in our own power uh, to overcome uh, the obstacles that they would present. Yeah, you know, um, tough love, radical love, love that Baldwin talks about in Fire Next Time, the kind of love that has at its core a stand right relation with one another. Love that is a force that is daring, that forces us to step outside of our comfort zones, that refuses the illusion of safety. You know, you know that, that line in Baldwin's, in, you know, Fire Next Time where he says, um, you know, we, that line, we, we can achieve our country, you know, if we, like lovers, dare. Da -da. But when he says like lovers, love here is not just simply agape. Love is eros. Love is... Uh, you know, this sense of vulnerability that one exposes oneself to another, right? And, and, and so that, that powerful force, that soul force that John Lewis exhibited um, because his faith was unshakable. Oh my God, what a gift to us. Well, I, I want to go, and, and for folks who are um, here, um, I ran downstairs so quickly. I left a couple of my Baldwin books and I left the cover to your book. And he said, I can't hold it up. You got a whole, you, I can show you that it is, it is well-worn and dog-eared, but thank you very much. Begin again. I might, I might ask you to hold it up again. I can only show the spine. Um, um, <laughs> but I, I, I can't tell you what this g did to me. Before um, the passing of these two great men, um, it was so fortifying to me and uh, my girlfriend will attest to the fact that I, 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 one night I just read through different pages of her. She's in California and just, just read a lot of the passages, the most difficult passages. I picked this book up in Zoom calls now and have been uh, drawing from it time and time again in interviews. Um, and I'm really hoping that, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, and you do not judge, artists don't judge uh, their their success by, you know, how many people buy their stuff. But it is amazing to see this book on the New York Times bestseller list on Amazon, you know, at the top, at a time that we see, you know, books about Trump selling, selling. You, you write a book about love and about 
hurt and about pain and about struggle and about um, eviscerating the lie and doing the work. And, and I thought before the, the, my first entree, and I wanted to use this text as a way of getting at some of these ideas that we're talking about, but I, I just, I'd love to go and, and talk about um, on page 66, um, a, a Baldwin uh, uh, wrote of King's murder and funeral. And, and maybe you can read his words um, uh, there that you, that, that you quote, um, if possible, Eddie. Sure, perhaps even more than death itself, that quote? Yes, please. Perhaps even more than the death itself, the manner of his death has forced me into a judgment concerning human life and human beings, which I have always been reluctant to make. Incontestably, alas, most people are not in action worth very much. And yet every human being is an unprecedented miracle. One tries to treat them as the miracles they are while trying to protect oneself against the disasters they've become. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I uh, <laughs> y you know, uh, and, and there was Lewis getting beaten on a bridge and the man would later come back and, and into his office and ask for his forgiveness. Yeah. And that's some kind of alchemy I don't, I don't necessarily know if I have, man. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't know what to make of that. It just gives you a sense of, you know, John Meachin refers to, to John Lewis as saintly, as a kind of saintly figure. Uh, but it reveals the capacity that we have, even though we might doubt that we have it in interesting sorts of ways. But you understand, um, you know, Lewis um, uh, left SNCC, as, uh, uh, as the Black Power movement was growing. And um, there were a lot of folks who, um, who didn't believe in this, the, the same philosophy that, that uh, John Lewis did. Not that they didn't have the same love, but in, in, am I wrong to say that Baldwin um, uh, seemed to stand in the breach in some ways between, um, you, you know, you quoted already from uh, the end of the fire next time, which I know he was criticized for those those last two pages mm -hmm. where he talked about the truly conscious whites and the truly conscious blacks who must come together like lovers and insist upon and create the consciousness of us all. Um, but he also had this loyalty to um, those within the black power struggle. And um, I, it, it was fascinating to me because it was it was contours of Baldwin's life that I didn't know about how, uh, in fact, maybe you could talk to a little bit about this when he was sitting up late at night uh, over drinks and, and made this um, profound profession that he would never betray uh, uh, these folks. And, yeah. um, and, and can, maybe you can go into that a little bit or if you want to pull from the actual text of your book. But I found that for me, seeing the, the current, it, it spoke to me a lot and it spoke to me about the current uh, um, protests and, and demands uh, a, a bit as well. But I'm hoping maybe you can p flesh that out for me. I think, Corey, you know, what's so important about the question you're asking is that it allows us to, to resist this narrative of decline. So we tell the story of the Black freedom struggle of the 20th century in a way that deodorizes it, right? So we got, you know, the typical narrative begins with Brown v. Board of Education in 54, the Montgomery bus boycott in 1950, the student sit-ins in 1960, right? The freedom rides of 61 um, and the like. And then of course, the, the penultimate, the ultimate moment of the March on Washington in 63, which then results in the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, which follows Selma. And then we jump ahead to 68 and, and the assassination of Dr. King. And as we narrate the story in that way, it's always the case that we say that moment in in, 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 in June of 66 in Greenwood, Mississippi, when Stokely Carmichael cries, no longer, will, I've been to jail X number of times, I'm not going to jail anymore, we're not gonna say freedom now, we're gonna say black power. Or that moment in October of 1966 when the Panther Party in Oakland is organized, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. We don't tell the story, for example, around Selma where there is this real debate where John Lewis has to march a, a march in the Selma march, not as the representative of Nick, right. falling out around, around this. Dr. King is critiqued for turning the march around. Many of those organizers leave and go into Lowndes County, Alabama. We tell the story 
as if it's a story of declension, that black power is the moment where we lost our way. And we do it as if the actors in these different moments are wholly different. As if the people who populated black power were not the same folk who were in some ways the shock troops of the civil rights movement. So there's a moment in 63 when, when both Howard, the nonviolent action group at Howard University had invited uh, Jamie Ball, Jimmy Baldwin uh, to campus along with Oliver Killings and, and, and others to talk about the role of art in the revolution. And, and Jimmy goes to an apartment afterwards to chop it up with the students until the sun comes up. And at the end, as the sun is rising and Baldwin is drank, you know, has had his Johnny Walker black as he was wont to do, he says, as you, I, if you promise your elder brother that you will not believe what this world is, says about you, I will promise you that I will never betray you. Now, who was in the room? Stokely Carmichael was in that room. Michael Thelwell was in that room. Cortland Cox was in that room. People like Muriel Tillinghast. You know, all of these folk, this, this contingent of Howard students who had been in the bowels of the South practicing nonviolent discipline. Stokely Carmichael said he never broke nonviolent discipline except for once when the police attacked King, right? And so we tell the story as if the through, as if there's no continuity. And what Baldwin says, we need to understand that the cry of these young folk for black power, the darkening of their eyes, their movement from a moral argument to a crude, not a crude, but a, a, a fundamental political argument around power has everything to do with the country's betrayal of them. Their eyes are a, a result of what they have experienced. It's like Stokely Carmichael said, we were in the bowels of the South. What we experienced was raw power, terror, he says. And, and it's in that moment, because remember, John Lewis is president of SNCC from 1963 to 1966, right? That's a long time. That's the March on Washington. That's the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. That's self, you know, so he's, and it breaks his heart that he has to separate from SNCC, right? And so I think I'm going on and on and on, Corey, because I think it's really- No, you're, you're preaching gospel. And, and so the, I, I'm just got all these notes of things I wanted to get over, but there was a moment, and I'm looking for it in my notes in preparation for the conversation. There was a moment where he, he um, uh, page 108, Esquire interview, um, where he talks about, uh, I think, you, please read this and contextualize that for us. I mean, th that was, again, one of those I had to read multiple times and, and highlight in my book. Go ahead. Uh, um, which one? Is it the Black Power Frightens them or the latter one that goes from uh, one, one on nine? I've got to now turn to, turn to my own notes, but I want you to, I think I want to read most of it. <laughs> okay, I'll, read, I'll, read, I'll read both quotes then. So. Okay. Um, White people cooling it means a very simple thing, he says. Black power frightens them. White power doesn't frighten them. Stokely is not, you know, bombing a country out of existence, not missing your children. White power is doing that. White people have to accept their history and their actual circumstances, and they won't. And then they asked him the question, uh, uh, when asked how would he talk to someone who was ready to tear up the town? Baldwin revealed what truly mattered to him. All I can tell him is that I'm with you, whatever that means. I'll tell you what I can't tell him. I can't tell him to submit and allow himself to be slaughtered. I can't tell him that, that he should not be armed because the white people are armed. What I tried to tell him too is, if you're ready to blow the cat's head off because it could come to that, try not to hate him for the sake of your soul's salvation and for no other reason. But let's try to be better. Let's try no matter what it costs us to be better than they are. You haven't, gotten, you haven't got to hate them, though we have to be free. It's a waste of time to hate them. My Lord. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, my God, I, I just want, I gotta, I, it's like I'm in church, I gotta, I gotta say it back to you. Uh, um, I, I, <laughs> try not to hate him. You know, if you're ready to blow a cat's head off, because it could come to that. Try not to hate him for the sake of your soul salvation and for no other reason, but let's try to be better. Let's try no matter what it costs us to be better than they are. Uh, you, haven't got, you haven't got to hate them though. We have to be free. It's a waste of time to hate them. And, and so 
I do want to talk about what it means to be free because I grew up uh, uh, hearing about this. I'm a free black man. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't talking about slavery. I was talking about, I knew when my dad and his fellas got together over alcohol, my dad used to get upset at me because I wasn't drinking. <laughs> I'm the boring one in the family. But um, this idea of this feeling of freedom, so I want to get to that, but I also want to get to this frustration that I've had in my lifetime that, that, that people seem to have gotten more upset. I'm not talking about this last six months, but I heard more people condemning Black Lives Matter when it first came forward when democratic politicians couldn't say the words. And, and yet they weren't getting upset with the, with, with the vestiges, I'll say, you might say straight up, uh, white supremacy that was being encountered. Um, with the uh, constant levels of police brutality, there was not uh, uh, upset about that. There was not upset about the rampant discrimination that exists in everywhere from healthcare to still to this day in America. Uh, we have the average uh, amount of money spent on the average black child in public education versus because we still have public education uh, that's based on property tax. So it's almost as if th these deep systemic racism, bigotry doesn't seem to get people's ire as much as saying something like black power or, or black lives matter, this assertion of that. And, 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 and yet that yet the, the burden that has to be borne by these young people mm. for daring to try to speak to that incongruency to try to get people to understand why I need an affirmation in a, in a society that does not treat all lives as if they matter equally, in a society that by, by the material fact, the data shows uh, uh, that this is an attempt uh, to, to, to uh, destroy black power, black wealth, systematically uh, destroy uh, um, uh, 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 black uh, health care, uh, uh, lack of access. Uh, um, I could go through all the things, black communities, through redlining, disinvestment. And, and so what is Baldwin really, in, in a sense, this idea of betrayal um, uh, uh, at a time that a lot of his, and you spoke to this, you know, he was getting a lot of criticism, correct, in his, later in his life, in his, when his celebrity grew from black people who were, to this day, frankly, he still has cr critics. Um, but yet there are people that were there at that night who would later say in their life, if I remember correctly, that he did not betray them. Yeah, you know, in, in, in the, his biography written with Michael Thelwell, Kwame Touré, Stoke, formerly Stoke, known as Stokely Carmichael, said he never betrayed us. He never betrayed us. You know, Jimmy was, um, and I call him Jimmy because he's been walking with me for 30 years and some yes. of my spirit. Um, but Baldwin, you know, he was very critical of what he called that mystical black bull, excuse my language. He was very critical of it, but he understood the, the justification for black power. And he also understood the bad faith of the de-engagement with it. And so this is what happens, right? We've been, we have been critiqued or criticized for the phrase, the slogan, black power. We were criticized for the phrase or the slogan, freedom now. We're criticized for the phrase, defund the police, right? We know that these phrases can draw the ire of those who are caught within the crosshairs of the critique. You know, you know, it's like, going back to the earlier part of your, your point, uh, Dr. King, in the latter part of his witness, said that he came to understand that people were more concerned about the images of the dogs and fire hoses than they were about justice. People are more concerned about civility and calm than they are about justice, right? And so what Baldwin was trying to do, and he knew the risk to his career, because the tide was turning. Folk were are scared of what these young folk were clamoring for and, 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 and the energy of black power, right? As it was represented in the streets and as it was beginning to press in the political sphere, Baldwin understood um, the cost, but he knew he had to bear witness. He had to give an account of what was happening. He had to make the suffering real. And he took the risk anyway. And what happened? People were like, he's lost the touch. He's compromised his art. Um, he's, a bad, he's an old man gone bad in the teeth. He just wants to stay relevant, right? Uh, his, his art has succumbed to propaganda. When in fact, when you think about, particularly post King's assassination court, Baldwin collapses. 
He's trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces in the face of the country's betrayal. Um, and he's trying to figure that out at the level of form and as well as the level of substance. Um, and do so while bearing witness to what the survivors are going through. And, and, and can I, I mean, this is so powerful because, but I, I, all while grappling with something that is, again, all of these are antecedents, I think, to what we are still talking about. I mean, the powerful thing about your book, and somebody asked earlier, I, I not only bought the book, marked it up, but I, I had to go back and listen to my, my friend read it. <laughs> so you actually are the one that reads the audio book. Somebody brought that out. And I'm telling you, uh, do that as well, um, uh, because it's, you, you read it with, with in, 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 in such a way that I know you're a professor, intellectual and all, but you could get a job uh, <laughs> working audible.com Newark company. Um, I want to talk about like that idea that he says, and I, you could probably find the quote, I didn't mark this one, where he talks about history is not the past. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the past. Right. A and in this conversation we're having today about statues, about the fact that America doesn't know what, many Americans didn't know what Juneteenth was, the fact that I, I don't know if I told you this, Eddie, I thought I grew up knowing about Black Wall Street. I had very conscious Black civil rights parents who were like, my brother and I were reading stuff that they never taught in my, my public school. But I always thought Black Wall Street was just the bombing of a street. I go down there, and my staff has pictures of, of, of this. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I could barely walk because I, the grief just w was hitting me. And then knowing that I didn't even know this history, the fullness, the, the 35, 40 blocks. I remember standing at the, one of the monuments looking at the businesses alone, rows and rows. And so th this, this history, though, Baldwin has some powerful, and I, you maybe can find it, because I'm going to go to, go, go ahead. It. Please read that. <laughs> Please so read this that. Is from, this is from White Man's Guilt. White Man, hear me. History, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read. And it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact, I'm on page 82, comes okay. from the area within us. And it is with great pain and terror that one begins to realize this in great pain and terror because one enters into battle with that historical creation oneself and attempts to create oneself according to a principle more humane and more liberating. And then skipping down, he says, people who imagine that history flatters them are impaled on that history like a butterfly on a pin and become incapable of seeing or changing themselves or the world. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I want to read this. Uh, I, I want to read some of your, your, your you're not quoting Baldwin, but you yourself on page 70, if I can. Um, it is telling to me that such brutality broke out over a fight regarding the symbols and uses of American history. I have said that America is an identity that white people will protect at any cost. And our history, our founding documents, our national heroes, our actions that cast us as a moral force in the world is the supporting argument that underpins that identity. The history is inseparable from the landscape that built the environment of the country in ways both from the monuments to the way communities are spatially organized, reinforce the story subtly and overtly. When Dr. King declared that the country's moral vision has been clouded by a poisonous fog of lies, you're quoting King there, and Baldwin said in Esquire that we need to look at what we are doing in the name of history. Both made clear that this history, the story we tell ourselves about what the country is and thus who we are, shapes the world we make going forward. Yeah. Yeah. The Confederate Monuments question makes plain that the history we tell ourselves is the key battleground for the country's future. <laughs> you know, those monuments are monuments of pride. The lost cause is a lie. We just need to call it what it is. It's not heritage. I'm from the South. The lost cause is a lie. Those statues were built for the most part in the moment at which Jim Crow segregation was being consolidated in the Southern region. As Confederate veterans were dying, this was 
these were this was a mon these are monuments to an ideology meant to terrorize black communities. What does it mean, Corey? That as a young kid in, growing up in Mississippi, I idolized Stonewall Jackson. What, what, what is happening? What was happening in that moment, right? So King is saying, because this is this, King uses that phrase, poisonous fog of lies, at the hundredth at the hundredth birthday celebration of W. E. B. Du Bois in Harlem. Mm. I mean, and he's and I I have I haven't found it yet. I think Vincent Harding helped write the speech, but the speech is a reflection on Du Bois's section in Black Reconstruction, the propaganda of history. And he's reflecting on what the lies about Reconstruction that in most, that if those lies were true, then it meant that Black people weren't capable of self-governance. We weren't capable of taking on the responsibility of citizenship. And those lies then poisoned the perception, the views of the broader American public about who we are, and who we are cap what we are capable of doing. And so King is saying to us, unless, and King is saying it, and Baldwin is saying it, and I'm saying it in our current moment, unless we confront not just simply the lies that we're hearing daily from the Oval Office, but the lies that map the landscape. When I say built environment court, you know, you got the Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville still standing, but that's one monument. Well, hell, the, monument, the, the highways in Chicago are monuments. <laughs> Think about how cities have been zoned, how highways were built, and for what purposes and what ends, and how they seg segmented and segregated communities on purpose. Right? I mean, my own state, you're right. The, the, the landscape of my state was governed by uh, bigotry because there was a desire to keep Black people cordoned into certain areas. You know, I, a lot of my elders in Newark told me how dangerous it was to walk north of Park Avenue just to walk that way because it was patrolled not by police even, but by people who just wanted to keep Blacks in. And, and those areas were, again, red line. Those areas where didn't have FHA loans. And so you see the whole topography of our country was formed that. My parents had to literally escape by by getting a white couple to pose as them right. <laughs> to, to, to be able to move into the town I grew up in. Right. And, and, and uh, you know, it's the, the, the disappearing of this history. You know, the federal, uh, the, 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 the land grants in the West. I've been out to the West. I met the beautiful families that still have from the 1800s the land grant that they were given as immigrants from Europe to get tracts of land. I read an article recently about 20% of Americans can trace their history back to land grant families. Incredible wealth, but blacks were excluded completely from that. Right. And and so I just I want to I want you to go a little deeper because your whole book there's a great there's a great you know before I go there I was curious cuz you use a lot of language. I love your language. I've always loved your language. That's why I think it is so important you to keep your, your, as my mom would say, your happy hips in that chair in MSNBC, um, because I think you are you are you are presenting America through your lived experience with language that we don't hear enough on TV. But you use a lot of this like chill, you use swaddling clothes, children growing up. America hasn't grown up, and and I had to sort of think about it when I was reading your book about you know what when I was a kid, uh, my dad was Superman. I mean, and I've heard you talk about your father. I mean, he was just like infallible. Mm -hmm. But when I grew up, I saw him for his humanity, that he, like all of us, are mountain ranges, peaks and valleys. And I confronted those valleys. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it deepened my love for him. Yeah. It was a maturer love. It was a recognition, as I heard you talk about your dad, that to, especially those periods to be a black man in America. And, and I, I understood why my dad would come home and put on some coal train and not want to talk to me until he poured himself a drink after being the first black salesman for IBM, uh, uh, into, going into a corporate culture. Uh, and and the, the, the slights or, or microaggressions that he must have experienced every day. 
and just need to sort. I could see his physicality, get a couple drinks, get some music, and have, see him relax. And so, but you sort of draw, if, if, tell me if I'm wrong, a parallel between us as Americans still stuck in this, in this view of our own history that's more Disneyified, like you would give a child, uh, uh, um, but yet not textured. And what I, I think I hear you saying is, not only is it urgent to confront our history and understand, as Baldwin would say, how it is deeply relevant in, to the present and the future, but if we are gonna really have a mature love, a deeper love for who we are as a people and have a hope of becoming the multiracial democracy that, that we have spoken to since, it was, since equal vote was denied women, that, that there has to be this, you use the language growing up. And I yeah. wonder if you could dig into that a little bit for me. It, that's such a great question, Corey. Um, you know, Baldwin believes in the Socratic dictum that the unexamined life is not worth living. And he holds this view, I'm getting to your point, I'm gonna come at it from a different direction. He holds the view that the messiness of, 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 our, of our society is actually a reflection of the messiness of our interior world of our interior lives, that our social, political, and economic arrangements, the, the messiness, the, the, the contradictions, the evils that run, that run through the society that we've organized is actually a reflection of the scaffolding of lies that, that hold us up. So we have to engage in an interrogation of who we are so that we can become different kinds of people, so that we can see each other for who we are as fallen, finite, fragile creatures, so that we can figure out a different way of being together. America is like Never Never Land, populated by, not, populated by the Lost Boys. <laughs> we don't want to be responsible or held accountable for anything. We just want to be the Redeemer Nation, the shining city on the hill, as Reagan called it, borrowing from uh, John Winthrop's The Model of Christian Charity. We want to be the example of democracy achieved, and we have the perfect ideology because we always say that no matter, no matter our practices, we're always on the road to a more perfect union. It's the perfect protection of our innocence. It gives us the perfect um, illusion of safety. It allows us to be willfully blind about what we're doing day in and day out. But a mature orientation, right, leaves behind the childish things. Uh oh, I'm invoking a biblical passage here, right? Yes. Leaving behind yes. the things you see. And, 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 and in doing so, we leave behind the swaddling clothes. Right? And we reach for a level of maturity that requires a, an unflinching confrontation with the ugliness of who we are. There's a line Baldwin wrote in an, in an essay in 1962, all the, all the Truth That We Must Bear. I just butchered the title, but that's, it's written in 1962. And he says, the trouble that we're in is deeper than we think. I'm paraphrasing here. The trouble is deeper than we think, colon, because the trouble is in us. <laughs> and so if we can't reach for a different way of being together, a different way of imagining, where we leave behind the illusion that we are examples of good walking around the planet, that we are an example of democracy already achieved, then we could never right. story, confront right. what we've done. Right. And, and I'm on the Foreign Relations Committee now, and I get in these conversations where people from other countries have called out this, these incongruencies, you would call them the lie, between who we say we are and who we're not. And, and look, I think when the Edmund Pez Bridge happened, that that was on the Russians used that to try to, in their propaganda, to try to say, who is this country that wants to tell us? you know, uh, 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 who they are. And, and, and I want to go, can you go to, um, cause there's a, there's a, um, there's a section that the words are, are haunt, haunted me because of the, because I felt this. And again, you, you put it into language page 25, like the, to 27, I'm going to go there real quick, but the, the words that kind of haunted me was, um, this idea of lingering in the dark moments. Mm. Uh, um, let, me, let me see if uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read and then I'm going to tell you where I'd like for you to pick up. It is not enough to merely acknowledge the dark moments, 
when the politics of fear threaten to overwhelm, as John Meacham does in his brilliant book, The Soul of America. It is a brilliant book. Uh, but then to move quickly to examples of hope that affirms the country's sense of its own exceptionalism. We were having conversations, Brother Glad, at, at, uh, about exceptionalism back when I was mayor, as you were, you, you had me in the corner and you landed the blows. I did not, <laughs> um, about American exceptionalism. But this is the part. We fail to linger in the dark, in, in the dark moments at our peril. What did you mean, uh, Dr. Gloud, by when we fail to link? Why is it constructive to linger in those dark moments? And why is it perilous to only focus on the, the Disney view of our own country's history? Because, you know, the, those dark moments, but in some ways, move us about. The terrors in the night provide yeah you know, that 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 really directs choice about our own lives think about you know i use that you know the line that comes after it, to be sure we have a vibrant democratic tradition and numerous examples of courageous voices like john lewis of course who risked every defense ideals but these after times feel the deep cellar of american life that two-storied sense of the country that's me rifting on william james Right and 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 this sense that 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 stellar, that other dimension of our psyche, that the darker elements, the wounds, the traumas, that guide our eyes, that inform and shape our choices, that give content to our fears, that if we don't deal with that darker side, that repressed self will do all the work, and we will not know. Right, we will not know. So I said the work. They, they work like the recurring nightmare that frightens a child because their power derives from a deep wound that overruns everything. One has to linger here. You move too quickly and you set yourself up for another nightmare. And we have to bear the burden of it. And here, that another nightmare, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing. I'm quoting Malcolm in that moment. Yes. Right. I'm riffing on the dream nightmare thing at that moment at the level of the writing. Yeah. Right. But the, I mean, but the, the unconfronted history, our failure to look in the dark, wretched corners of our past has made us not yet capable to deal with the injustice in the present. And, and if you flip the page to 26, Baldwin writes to accept one's past, one's history is not the same thing as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it and un invented past can never be used it cracks an invented excuse me an invented past what we have right now can be used it cracks and crumbles under the pressures of life like clay in a season of drought how can the american negro's past be used the unprecedented price demanded and at this embattled hour of the world's history is the transcendence of the realities of color of nations and of altars yeah yeah, John, I mean, Baldwin understood, man, the, what these idols meant, right? How they keep you from looking at, um, at, at who we actually are. I mean, this is, and one of the attractions that he has to Henry James is that those, those things that get in the way of us seeing each other. This is not a sentimental idea that we're just human beings. And, you know, that's not what he's looking But what are these, how do these categories block us from seeing the complex human being right in front of us? Where, we, where our suffering can be the bridge between us. And if we work through the pain together, maybe me working through my pain and trying to help you work through yours, I can get beyond it and we can become different kinds of human beings. But isn't that, the, I mean, preach brother, because that's, that is the parallel to draw. If you have trauma as an individual and you have not confronted that trauma, a consensus of psychological professionals are gonna tell you it's going to destroy you. It's going to manifest. It's going to contort you. you. You may intellectually know who you are, but that unconfronted trauma that I see, unfortunately, too often in this world of traumatized people, it, it, it is dangerous to the whole body. And, you know, and for me, Corey, what I'm trying to do in the text is to say one of the through lines of our journey, Black folks' journey in this country, is, in fact, trauma. I'm not just talking about you know, at, at a certain level. And we can talk about that trauma at a number of different levels. The PTSD that you've witnessed, that we've seen, 
uh, in our families and, and friends, people who have to navigate uh, uh, violent neighborhoods and having to deal with death uh, on a regular basis, the precarity of their own lives. But I'm talking about the trauma at a certain other, at a tip, another level of abstraction, the trauma of the nation continually betraying us, turning its back on us, right? The trauma of what it means for at, at every turn, the country having an opportunity to be otherwise and then doubling down on its ugliness. So even in this moment, Jimmy says in this moment, so you read that quote from the fire next time in 63 that you just read. But by 1972, listen at the tone, 10 years later, let's close to 10 years later, going down back on the same page, 26. As the black glories in his newfound color, which is his at last and asserts not always with the very greatest politeness, the unanswerable validity and power of his being, he just riffed on black is beautiful right there. Even in the shadow of death, the white is very often affronted and very often made afraid. Black is beautiful, scares them. Black lives matter, scares them, right? And one may indeed be wary, but the point is that it was inevitable that black and white should arrive at this dizzying height of tension. Only when we have passed this moment will we know what our history has made of us. Mm. Mm. We gotta go through this. Yes. And get to the other side, but you can't go around it. No. We can't lie about it. No, and and that's why you see African nations, the truth and reconciliation, a telling, a coming forward, a play, playing in all his plane. I want to fast forward just because I want to get to um, that human pain. I mean, I didn't know Baldwin had tried suicide twice. I want to, so I want to get, I want to foreshadow that about all of us who are who who feel that deep pain and have to deal with how do you find will to go on. But I, I just want to keep, I want to pin this down on the history because as a guy who is the sponsor of HR 40 in the Senate yeah, and, and people are, for, uh, Schumer finally came on the bill. I was like, you know, thank God, Broca Chef. exactly. Yes, Chuck Schumer is on the reparations bill because why are we afraid even to bring this country together and have a, a conversation with the, with, 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 with the uh, data scientists and, historians and others, why are we even afraid to have the conversation about that past? Some of it, we could literally trace the, the financial damages uh, and more. So, but I, I just, I just think, I, I just want to fast forward, read your own words. This is, this was me when I first op cracked open this book. You got to put the book up again, man. Come on. Uh, I, I was only on page 27 and I, you already, I know when a book has to get me up and I have to walk around a little bit and come back down to sit down to calm myself down and because my mind is, is working and I'm writing all kind of notes. Um, but but you, so Baldwin is powerful. You unpack my, who I, who I thought I knew, he's my favorite author, but you unpack him in ways that just opened up a whole new world to me. But your writing is, is what I have found so much power. And I want to read two sections of what you wrote. What can we learn from how Baldwin made his way through the aftertimes? How did he see his task as a writer in that moment, and what lessons can we draw from it about what we must do on our own? We have to tell a different story about who we are by way of an honest encounter with our past, the challenges, the reputation of myths and legends in the guise of nostalgia for simpler times. And like Baldwin, we must never lose sight as we finger the pain and disillusionment of our after times, of the possibility of a new Jerusalem. We have to do this for all those young people who risked everything to change the country, for those who have gone mad, who, have, who gave us their last breath, and for those who now face the temptation of accepting the world as it is, as opposed to what it can be. It is, after all, a declaration of responsibility and love. It is a declaration of responsibility and love. That, that, Dr. Glaub, that's, that's powerful. You know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm kind, I get emotional because um, I remember writing that passage. And you, you mentioned um, 
earlier about about me barely surviving uh, writing the book, but this this that was one of those passages that I worked on a lot, and I'm I'm trying to pull the thread of what Jimmy said to those Nick's those Nick students at Howard. And I'm trying to think about what they were feeling in the moment in 63, because they would experience eventually the burning, the 16th, the bombing of, of the 16th Street Baptist Church. They would see uh, the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson. They were going to experience hell. Um, and Jimmy saw that on the horizon. I was thinking about Black Lives Matter and all of those kids in 2014, all those babies at, in Ferguson who who aren't here, many who are, many who, who they say committed suicide, but we don't know, who were, who were languishing when the cameras left, who were still organizing and fighting. And I was thinking also about the, the, what Jimmy said in, in Just Above My Head, which gave me the title of the book. Responsibility is not lost, it's abdicated. And if one refuses abdication, then one begins again. Mm. And the only way you can find the energy to begin again is, is in the overwhelming power of love. You got to love, man. And, and, and so I was just thinking about this in this moment and thinking about all of these young people who are out in the, in the middle of a pandemic in Portland, in Chicago, right, right now. It just it just calls it calls me to attention, if that makes sense, um, and lets me know the, the stakes. Yeah, but anyway, I'm so, sorry. so I, I I just want to because I want to get into that that pain, but I just want to just want to give people a taste, um, because you do it's you don't ignore Trump, but towards the end of the book you make a very powerful point that Trump is not exceptional. Trump is us, and it was this indictment when I read that, and I had to read that over a few times, because you make this eloquent proposition that we made Trump possible. Mm. He's not somebody out there, let's get rid of Trump and we all back, no. And, and you, 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 you ground this book in a way, even in the very introduction that I think is so uh, um, powerful. And I just, wanna, uh, I just wanna read that, and then I wanna get back to the, the, the searching I feel in this book and, and, and how it spoke to me and my own journey, and I hope it speaks to the people that are with us, but uh, uh, to be sure, the idea of America is in deep trouble, though many will find consolation in the principles of our founders or in the resilience of the American story, the fact remains that we stand on a knife's edge. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump's presidency unleashed forces howling beneath our politics since the tumult of the 60s. For decades, politicians have stoked and exploited white resentment. Corporations consolidated their hold on government and cut American workers off at the knees. Ideas of the public good were reduced to the unrelenting pursuit of self-interest. Communities fractured, demographics shifted, resentments deepened, the national fabric frayed, and we are all at one another's throats. Mm. Those relentless ghosts underneath our politics now haunt openly and the presidential election alone will not satisfy their hunger. A moral reckoning is upon us, and we have to decide once and for all whether or not we will truly be a multiracial democracy. This, to me, in the introduction, frames the journey you take us on, and, and, and the fact that in many ways you gifted me a, a, a few things, in this, money things in this book, but you, you didn't answer that question of whether, whether we will be. And, and in a sense, that brings me to the anguish that everyone, I shouldn't say that, that, that most felt when they saw a knee on the neck of a man named George Floyd. The anguish knowing, imagining you lying with your lover and in an instant, un plainclothes people break in and shoot her to death watching time and time again Ahmaud Arbery's savage murder just jogging in his neighborhood. And, and there's something about this book that, that, that speaks to that, the grief and the hurt and the anguish and the yearning 
for who we want to see us become and the work that we haven't fully confronted ever. And I guess I, I wonder within that, and I, and, I, and I listened, as I said at the beginning, to you and Dr. West, who taught me <laughs> still I, those, did those lunches. You, 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 I remember we went out afterwards to, to sit down. Oh, I had come down to Princeton to speak, I forgot. And you guys took me out afterwards and confronted me with the, the different definitional differences between hope and optimism. Right. And it was such a powerful moment for me that you kind of shoved me into understanding really even my own community of which I'm in now. Uh, uh, you, you know, and maybe you can explore that you quoted, I always thought hope had to be resurrected daily. You, you, you quoted, you, I heard then Cornell in that conversation about, he quoted someone else saying that, can you go into that for me? And, and I remember, you know, uh, yeah. good morning, heartache. He, he even went <laughs> lyrical on me. But yeah, maybe you could explore that. That's, that's Baldwin's quote. Um, hope is invented every day. Hope is an action verb. It's not a state, right? And, and what does it mean? Baldwin is saying, because he's some a reporter from Ebony is asking him a question. He's in Istanbul. He's collapsed. He's tried, he's trying to pick himself up after the attempted suicide in 69. He's in Istanbul trying to write uh, No Name in the Street, which is the first book published after the assassination of Dr. King. And the guy is like, why Istanbul? Where, where? So he answers that question. He said, from whence hope? And Baldwin's like, hope is invented every day. And then in, in some ways, it is this desperate act to hold on in the face of, of, of the overwhelming odds that one confronts, right? It's the hope that the enslaved felt in that moment when everything seemed to be defined by the brutality and cruelty of their situation. And yet there was hope found in the glimmer of love that she saw in the man's eyes or hope found in that momentary sound of innocence that you heard in a child running around, right? Such that you can then imagine beyond the opacity of one's condition in that moment. Hope is invented every single day, you know? Um, but you know, you can't be Pollyannish about it. We're wounded, Doc. This place has wounded us. Those cuts, those daily cuts hurt. And we have to raise our babies to survive this mess daily. Um, and I think Baldwin is trying to give us resources to figure out how to, you know, it's, I use this language, it's Sisyphean, but how to push the rock up the hill again. Yes. And see, it's very clear, Corey, that what we're talking about is not just simply abstract. The invocation of love is not just simply abstraction. We've been laying out over the course of our conversation, that the results that we're talking about, that, that the reality that we're talking about is the result of policy, that there have been deliberate choices made over the course of this country's history that have produced the wealth gap, that has produced residential segregation, that has produced right uh, this ongoing kind of disaster or catastrophe that is white supremacy in this country, and that the only way we're going to respond to it is by way of policy. But then you and I know, because we were in those late night lunches, Dennis with Cornell, justice is what love looks like in public. Yes. Yes. Or just society, then we're doing love's work. Yes. If that makes sense. You know? No, it does make sense. And and I tell you, um, I'm gonna ask you to read the last thing that and this made me cry. Uh uh, could you read um on page one oh five uh from the uses of the blues? Oh uh, yes. Yeah. And and then and 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 then let's let's I just want to do a little bit more of an exploration of love, and then I'm going to let you uh, have the rest of your Sunday night. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe I'm sitting, you know, do you guys know that this is a U.S. senator? I mean, let's just be, I want to emphasize that this U.S. senator is sitting down with me. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's just, I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to have to call my mom. <laughs> I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading some of these great comments by... Uh, by some of the people. And uh, I agree with Latanya Max Scout. Eddie Glaub speaks to your spirit. He is so inspirational. Uh, uh, somebody already quoted our brother West, justice is what love looks like in public. Wow. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh oh, so I'm grateful to, to hear a Morehouse man. Uh, oh. uh, uh, so, so you've got oh. a lot of, 
people listening, and, and I'm really hoping that uh, people will go on, on the journey and read this book because it is it is it is a journey, and it and it is tilled the soil of my soul and planted seeds for a future harvest. So, uh, keep, keep read that section, please. This is uh, Baldwin um, from Uses of the Blues. I'm talking about what happens to you if having barely escaped suicide or death or madness or yourself, you watch your children growing up and no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you're powerless. You're really powerless against the force of the world that is out to tell your child that he has no right to be alive and no amount of liberal jargon and no amount of talk about how well and how far we have progressed does anything to soften or to point out any solution to this dilemma in every generation, ever since Negroes have been here, every Negro mother and father has had to face that child and try to create in that child some way of surviving this particular world, some way to make the child who will be despised not despise himself. I don't know what the Negro problem means to white people, but this is what it means to Negroes. And, and that's the tradition. My parents taught me, try to insulate me from a world that would treat you differently because of the color of your skin. Try to give me the armaments and, and the defensive uh, uh, um, ability. And, and, you, and you know what, Corey, what's so important about this formulation, besides the power of Baldwin's prose, um, is it, it reveals the, re the revolutionary inversion at the heart of his social criticism. The problem ain't us. <laughs> That's what the problem's not us, right? I write it. I write in my on, on page one hundred six. Baldwin maintained that navigating contradiction was the true Negro problem, not a problem of black people, but a problem for black people presented by the problem with white people. The fact that we have to work so hard to prevent this nonsense from taking root in our children has little to nothing to do with us, he argued. It is a consequence of white America's problem. We are simply trying to keep our heads above water and prevent our babies from drowning. Would you, would you go, I don't remember the page, with the Esquire magazine about oh. that, that where he just simply says, you know, but aren't the black people the ones that are dying? Yeah. Yeah, That's, if you can find that for me. That's the, the, the reckoning chapter. Yes, absolutely. Um, let me find it. Oh Lord, did I, did I? Am I getting? I'm getting old, Corey. I, <laughs> I think you're. I think you're a couple years younger than me, so don't say that, man. <laughs> but yeah, that's that that wonderful line in 1968 in the Esquire um, uh, interview where he uh, says it's not for us to cool it, right? That's what yeah, we're that's it. That is exactly uh, it. Think, uh, 108, 109. Let me check. Let me make sure. No, we just read that one. It might be 67, 68. I think. It's 768, yeah. Yes, it's 67. Got it, yep, looking at it. In, in July of 1968, just a few months after King's assassination and against the backdrop of American cities burning, Baldwin gave an interview to Esquire. He set the tone, quote, question, how can we get the black people to cool it? It is not for us to cool it. But aren't you the ones who are getting hurt the most? No, we are only the ones who are dying fastest. And, and so this gets me to the, maybe the final point of love, because Baldwin, uh, he, he never surrendered the, the conception of love and this, uh, this understanding that at the end of the day, uh, you know, he says that in the final, and I, I went to bring my Fire Next Time book down, but, you know, the, the value placed on the color of the skin is always a delusion. <laughs> That's the exact, uh, you know, screw this. I'm taking you upstairs real quick. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you as I'm walking upstairs. Um, uh, um, <laughs> you're gonna tour my house, man, because because there's two of my favorite pages in literature. But but uh, I just wanted to ask you about this. Un, uh, this he would not stop loving. I mean, he he deeply loved people. He did not engage. A powerful up critic. Um, there you go. What's that? You were breaking up on me for a minute. But go ahead. Yeah, he 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 would he he never he 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 never stopped being a fearsome critic of the status quo. But he also loved. He he had this relentless love. And to bring us full circle to John Lewis, 
Mm. And, and so, I mean, love achieves impossible things. Uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is what he, this is from uh, Fire Next Time. Same copy you have, 104. For the sake of one's children, yeah. in order to minimize the bill that they must pay, mm. one must be careful not to take refuge in any delusion. And the value placed on the color of the skin is always and everywhere and forever a delusion. I know what I'm asking you is impossible, but in our times, as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand. And one is, after all, emboldened by the spectacle of human history in general, mm. and Negro history in particular, mm. for it testifies to nothing less than the perpetual achievement of the impossible. And that, that's the revolutionary artist, right? Yes. That's the poet bearing witness. That's the poet who still finds love even in the midst of his own descent into madness. Yes. Right? Still finds love. And not, again, it's not <laughs> love evidenced in our traditions, love evidenced in our practices, love evidenced in our social arrangements, right? Because the lie, which is at the heart, the architecture that allows for this valuation, the value gap, the belief that white people matter more, how that belief organizes so much of our lives, how the lie protects it, right? It produces the kind of people that, that will throw democracy away. Right, but I don't want, I don't want the, the saccharine love that, 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 I, that you often hear, all you need is love, uh, you know, I just, the reality is, is love, real love is battered. It is bruised. It has been bloody. Real love gets beat down like C.T. Vance and gets its ass back up and, and keeps on loving. Love is calloused. Love has grown up, as you would say, uh, and, and, and has shed that naivete. Love will stare in the face their child and tell them they've been wrong. Uh, they, they came home uh, uh, drunk, they're addicted, they're, they're, and love them anyway. Uh, but not fail to call that out. And that's real love. Love doesn't put its head in the sand and ignore the truth or obscure the history or tell lies convenient and, 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 and nice sounding. And so Baldwin, and, 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 he, and, and the, the end of that paragraph on the next page, he doesn't end with some nicety, oh, we, we shall overcome someday. No, <laughs> he, he, at the end of the fire next time, he warns everything. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. In other words, you are responsible. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. And if we, and, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of others, do not falter in our duty. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not now dare everything, the daring of John Lewis, the daring of Vance, the daring of, uh, of Stokely Carmichael, uh, the daring of our forefathers and mothers, if we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible in a song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time. This is the prophecy, 63. No name in the street is the reckoning, 72. Harlem explodes right after this. Mm. The country turns its back. Remember 68, I know we got to go. 68 was the last major piece of legislation. Yes. There 12 years later, Ronald Reagan is elected to undo it all. Yes. And, 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 and elected with a more open and overt appeals to white resentment. And I mean, this is the age of Reagan. Then we got the age of Willie Horton. I mean, I can go through how what brought into our politics. And also, we didn't talk about this, which we have to say for another conversation, a brand of capitalism that, that perverted what Adam Smith originally wrote about in the moral sentiments and became were the virtues of our country, like love, like, like sacred honor. Th these virtues that never fully achieved, but aspire to get, get cast aside for greed and profit in its, in its name in an end and of itself. And I can keep going through the historical antecedents to this moment where the Supreme Court the jurisprudence changed. 
Antitrust laws get, got start getting torn down. The age of Bork, another Reagan vestige, uh, uh, that began to bring about a, 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 a capitalism that destroyed the gains of workers' rights, that began to erode collective bargaining, that led to the erosion of this idea that even minimum wage should be above poverty line, which it's not right now, which began to erode, erode this collective sense of responsibility to heal uh, 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 contaminated sites, which led us to this time of Trump, which we even see a Republican party contort itself against its own ideals of immigration to start to and, truly dehumanize others. And that's an important move you just made. We tend to tell the story of Donald Trump as if it goes from Trump to Pat Buchanan, to George Wallace, to Strom Thurmond. We put him in the tradition of the racist demagogues. No, 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 no. He's a caricature of the age of Reagan. He is the extreme edition of Reaganism. And you know, at the end, you're right. There's a line that Baldwin uses. Um, it's, I say that to crush a serpent is in some ways his ode to love. Salvation, he writes, is not flight from the raft of God. It is accepting and reciprocating the love of God. Salvation is not separation. It is the beginning of union with all that is or has been or will ever be. Love, as I write, opens up the rusted lid of the heart. And if we are to be together differently, we have to confront what we've done in order to open ourselves up to being otherwise. As Jimmy put it in The Liberator, let us do something unprecedented. Let's create a self without the need for enemies. My Lord. <laughs> Amen, brother. All right. <laughs> I'm telling you, this book is an ode to love. You go to dark places, you linger there. As Zora Neale Hurston, I guess that's, what did she say? I've been through Sorrow's Kitchen and I've licked out all the pots. You, 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 go, you go deep, deep, deep in this book. It is, it is literally, if I had to put on the, the reads of the 20th century, the 21st century of mine, this, this, this goes high on my bookshelf. Uh, and um, I just want to thank you because it's so immediately relevant to what we're grappling with uh, 100 days out from the most consequential election of our lifetime. When we have a chance to recreate history or make the mistake of just trying to go back to some sense of normalcy, some back to sense of comfort and forget the lessons of our ancestors that peace is not the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. And you are uh, a justice warrior. You are a great uh, intellect. You are a poet. And you, and right now, which I think is wonderful for me to watch, is now that I've known you for uh, going back, uh, closing in on 15 years, um, you are now emerging as, uh, I think, one of the more important voices um, uh, in our national, uh, uh, in the national chorus of voices that we hear so often. But I know when I'm flipping through channels and I see you on uh, MSNBC, I stop because I know you're going to say something that is not being said and challenge me. Uh, you've made me a better, a better man. You've made me a better senator. And uh, I'm honored to be your friend, brother. Thank you for spending. You went overtime. This is overtime now. You went an hour and, and 17 minutes. A professor's time is expensive stuff. I know you got, you know, I know, I know how difficult it is. Politicians, we just talk. <laughs> Well, I, I love you to death. Love you to life. Thank you, man. Just stay, take care. Tonight, so tonight, much. rest in power. What, we, what are we going to do tomorrow? We are going to reinvent hope. Oh, because hope is invented every, every day. day. Every day. Amen. Amen. Love you. Love you, brother. Love, love you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining in one more time. Um, um, if, 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 do like I did. Get the book and listen to him. Read it. Um, it is it is a, an incredible book, um, uh, and I hope that people uh, got a taste of what you'll find in, in that and conversations uh, that we need to have. And I hope we could do this again sometime, man, before the maybe even before the presidential election. Um, just take the time to uh, sit and have a have a Sunday evening conversation, maybe go to church a little bit. Uh, but thank yeah. you. You've, you've definitely got me there. Love you, man. Love you, too. All right. Good night now, everybody.